Hello, welcome to Football Journeys, a B5 consultancy podcast presented by me, Matt Hemsworth. And me, Fraser Franks. Football Journeys is a podcast that ignores the glitz and the glamour of the beautiful game in favour of the pain, the graft and the rejection. Uh, for my part, I've been a media lawyer for nearly 20 years now and I work with clubs and I work with players to help protect their reputation and their privacy but ultimately it's about protecting the well-being of the young men and women uh, that go through that journey through the game that we love. And for me, I've been through that journey. I was an academy player at Chelsea and Brentford before setting on a career in the lower leagues with the likes of Luton Town, Stevenage and Newport County. Before my career ended at the age of 28, I went into a heart defect. B5 Consultancy is about combining that experience to help players young and old, um, to make good decisions off the pitch, uh, but also to be there to support players when life doesn't go according to plan. In this series, we're talking to Liverpool FC's class of 2013-14. Those lads that came through that famous academy at Kirby, but didn't quite make it through to realise their Anfield dream. This is Football Journeys. This week we're on Zoom, and to the various lockdowns and restrictions that have been in place, particularly in football, we've been unable to have a face-to-face with any of our interviewees. We're talking to Conor Randall, a lad that managed more first-team games than any of our guests, playing eight times for the Anfield team. Conor talks brilliantly and openly about the pressure of being a local boy playing first-team football for the Reds, including dealing with the criticism and abuse that followed when he didn't end up becoming a club legend and playing hundreds of games for Liverpool. A lone move to Hearts in the Scottish Premiership earned him some respite, but by the end of his long spell at Liverpool, he was in need of a rest, and he looked for what he called a mad move, which ended up transpiring with a move to Arda Kadzvali in Bulgaria. Covid-19 cut that spell short, and he's now back in the Scottish Premiership with Ross County. Connor cuts a wise and mature figure, and is able to talk now from a position of strength about the incredible pressures that he was under as a young man. There are some super lessons in this podcast to be learned by any young player or indeed by parent listening to his story. So, Connor, thanks, mate. Thanks for talking to us today. And we're really sorry we're not up there with you in Scotland, but thanks for talking to us today on Zoom. No, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, it would have been good to do it in person, but, you know, things are, it, it is what it is, isn't it? Well, look, uh, let's start at the beginning on, on your story, as we do with, with all the lads. We want to talk about little Connor. Um, and I don't think there was much of a time before Liverpool for you. Talk to us about your family. Is it football man family? Dad driving you in terms of that? Yeah, it was just like my dad. My dad was pushing me, obviously in in a good way. He was a big football fan himself. Played a bit when he was younger, and then obviously had my granddad as well. He was a big part in me me academy journey because he was taking me most nights. Obviously, my dad was working away and things. My granddad would be. At the academy, taking me every night when rain or snow, you know, we'd be out on the pitch and he'd be sat at the, the side of the pitch. The only person there, some nights, wrapped up, he had all his, all his gear and umbrellas up and all that. But I don't think, I can really recall a session that he would have missed. So I owe a lot to them and obviously all my family, yeah. My dad's obviously a big red, he used to go all the games and that when he was younger. So yeah, it was, like you said, it's all over and all, really. A Liverpool fan, 100%. Always have been. Even when you're playing, like you're, you're there and you're in and around it, you still feel just feel like one of the, the luckiest fans in the world to be to be to experience it that close up. But I don't think that fan, as a Liverpool fan, it never leaves you. Do you know what I mean? So it's um, that's all you have. Really, is growing up, you're a fan, and, and that just stays stays with you the whole way through. It doesn't doesn't change. If anyone's listened to the Jordan Williams episode, he he mentioned as soon as he signs from from Wrexham. He gets thrust into the, I think it was the under-14s, and you're the first name that he mentions, and he says, couldn't believe how good Conor Randall was, and, you know, he was a centre midfield player, and he was like Steven Gerrard. Did you feel like you were one of the better players in your age group from a, from a young age? Yeah, I think, obviously, when, when, you're, when you're that age, you're just going and you're, you're playing and training with your mates every week, and you're not really thinking too far ahead or anything about that, I think. Obviously, the feedback that you get from from the coaches um, and things like that, you can tell, you know, if the, when when you do rate it and things like that. So you've, you've always got a sort of an idea, but I don't really think it, it comes into your mind in that sense. Um, but yeah, because I can always remember when Jordan we played Joe Jordan play for Everton. Um, I don't know if he was on trial there or he was just whatever he was up to there. He, he played them like on a Saturday or something. 
Um, obviously, we were playing midfield. He was playing midfield. And then we walked into the changes on the Monday night. And he was just sitting there on the bench. And I think, shall we play, play the institute the other, like, the other day? And he sat for us. Um, but always never him telling me about that game. He was like, oh, yeah, our coach said. Um, he had some of my marking in the game and that. So I think, you, you know, when you hear things and that, and obviously the feedback you get from coaches and stuff, you sort of, you can sort of gauge, if, you know, yeah, what, what, 50 rated and stuff like that. But when you're young, I think you just go and you just play, you know, there's no, no pressure on the game. It's just more about enjoyment and going, enjoying your football. When we met with Jordan, there were two players, Connor and Nathan Burke, who he identified as the outstanding players in that age group. I think with scousers, they're not shy, so you have to be, you know, you've got to go in there and really push yourself. And there were some very good players, you know, you had like Connor Randall, he was the best player I've seen at that age. Um, I, I thought he was going to be on, like when people, when I first come in, they were like, he's like Steven Gerrard and you could actually tell it, do you know what I mean? He was just so good. And uh, there was another lad called Nathan Burke who was very highly rated as well. Um, I still speak to like Nathan and Con now, but um, like they played midfields, and my mum said like, this is the only way you're going to get in there is if you're cheeky and you've got to push yourself." So I wanted to ask you about England. So you played a little bit of representative. You didn't play across the board, but um, I think you went away of England to an under 17s Nordic tournament. Tell us a little bit about playing for your country. Yeah, I think obviously. The older you get, more things start to happen, more opportunities can happen, and obviously it starts to get a bit more serious in terms of footy and that. Um, I think the first time you have like a sort of like a trial where all the you know all the, the better lads from each club go to and train with England for a few days. I think that's under it's under fifteens, maybe under fourteens, um, and then you have the victory shield, so you sort of go to that and then come off that board and then, but I got injured after that and I missed the, the rest of that season so obviously that victory shields when you're a kid that's one of the major the major things to, to try and get involved in but no so I went to the at yeah, the Nord yeah I went there and it was obviously it was good yeah it was a it was a pleasure to you know to be able to you know put a different kit on it was what a Liverpool kit your all your all life growing up and you know, put the England kit on it was it was good and it was it was an honour to do it even at even at that age. But yeah, I remember the tournament well. My dad was out there again. He, you know, he goes and watches me everywhere. So he, he made the trip out there, and it was it was it was good for for him to see as well. Do you know what I mean? It would have been a proud moment for him, and it was it was for me as well. It was um, a good experience. Did you get to keep your England shirt? And if so, have you still got it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's um, it's up in a frame. And my dad's I've got a bedroom, and my dad's where I used to stay when I was little. Um, that's just full of um, like loads of my old shirts and that, and there's uh, the England shirts up there with them. Um, yeah, he's put it in a frame, like a picture underneath me playing for them and all that. But there's a few shirts in there, like in that room. So it's always nice when you go back and, and you see it and bring back some, some memories. Whilst Connor's development at Liverpool as a teenager was significant, like many players of his age, injuries played a part. At the age of 15, he suffered a stress fracture, which kept him out of the game for a prolonged period. So I think that was, yeah, I missed like near enough things, like eight months or whatever it was with, with the stress factor in my back. But I think that even now it's, that was, they changed all the rehab and you're only out for it, you know, a couple of months or something. I don't know, but at the time it was like obviously a long, you couldn't do nothing for a while and you had to wear a big, big back brace and all that. So I was in school, I had a big back brace underneath your shirt and all that. So it was, it wasn't ideal, like it wasn't, and there wasn't much else you could do on it. So it was literally, you gone from, you know, I was a kid training every day and all that, and you had to take, I don't know however long it was, where you literally couldn't do anything at all. So I missed most of that that season would have been, I think the under-15 season that would have been then. So I missed most of that. Then I come back, but then I was still in the under-16s. I was still playing, and we had Steve Cooper as our manager. I played centre, centre midfield all that season. Um, and not, I was still doing well in the position then, because that's when I got me, got me pro from from that, from playing under sixteens there. So um yeah, so it went after that. It was would have been the first year scholar when I whatever can't remember whatever the reason was. I don't think we had a right back in the team at the time. Um and I'd been out injured or whatever, so I must have been seventeen or and I come back and I remember it was keeps were saying like, you know, we haven't got a right back. We think you could play there, but it'd be good to just get the minutes in, just to slot in there, get a few games on the belt, get your minutes there. Um 
done all right and then just never really fully come back out to right back. So that was sort of around probably around 17 it would have been when I first started playing playing as a right back. Even being honest, like I hated it. I hated it from when I was 17 till probably even a couple of years ago. I've always been trying to get myself out of there somehow, even rightly or wrongly, do you know what I mean? It's probably is the position obviously I've ended up playing there, but all that was always like a battle I had within myself. I was always trying to just get back into midfield because obviously I grew up grew up playing there and you know enjoyed it so much and that was what I used to. And that's what so yeah, so I played because I remember the phone call when you say about going into the first team. So I was playing, played right back obviously for the under 18s and then the second season when we had Neil Clitchy as the manager, played right back all that season. Then went in start stepped up into the 21s. And I was still playing right back, so that must have been like for a good, a good few years. And then Mick Beal was uh, was the coach uh, for the under twenty ones team, and obviously I'm back, I'm right back then. That's where I've been playing all the time. And I, um, I remember having a conversation with him because it was still the same. It was always the case, just something that was just always niggling at me that I just didn't enjoy playing there. So I remember speaking speaking to Mick. I was playing for the twenty for the twenty ones, and said to him, "I just I don't enjoy it. Like I, I wanna." I want to play midfield. I know we've got a lot of good midfielders and that. Um, and I said, I can, I'll come out to the team and try and prove myself as a midfielder in training to get myself in the team. I, I like, I'll accept that. And because I just, I just, it was just something that had been going on and on. And it just got to a point where I thought, yeah, I just, I can't, I'm not enjoying it being a right back sort of thing. So I had that conversation with Mick and he was, you know, he was like, to be honest, he said you could be creating a problem that's not there because you, you're playing right back going to midfield and, and oh, there's more competition. And I said, the now I said, but that's just a chance I want to take sort of thing. So we sort of started doing that. Uh, like I'd be on the bench in a couple of games and then coming on in midfield and started getting a little bit more in midfield. And I was, I was enjoying it. Even though I weren't starting games that I could have been starting as a right back, I was enjoying coming on for 20 minutes playing midfield and trying to you know, get in the team. And then I remember we were off one day and I was just in my room, you know, just on a PlayStation or whatever. And, and it was obviously when this was when this was for to when Klopp had just come in and Mick rang me and just said, obviously, he looked, he looked through the profile of players and he said, what kind of players he wants in each position and that. And when I got to fullback, he mentioned like a profile that sort of suits you that, that you want. So obviously, we've had the conversation and it's something that, that could, you know, be a potential way to the first team. Because I think at the time there wasn't too many right backs, or they were short, and obviously needed cover or whatever. So obviously, if it's a chance to go to the first team, then I'm, you know, just sort of back up a bit and just accept it. I was sort of just trying to get back into midfield, and then after that phone call happened, and it was a case of like, well, that's a chance I could go and play for for Liverpool or be involved in the first team, which if all oh, you've wanted all your career, so it's a no-brainer. So yeah, I never managed to get myself out of there, like so. We spoke to McBeal about Connor's desire to transition back to midfield and his change of heart when Jurgen Klopp came calling. Yeah, great kid, really, really great kid. We had a bit of a tough time because I was the Neil Critchley had made him a right back and captain of the U team. He'd come to me in the 23s, was playing right back. He was obviously competing with Trent, and there was one or two others around as well at the time. And he wanted to be a centre midfielder. So famously, like the week that Jurgen almost joined Liverpool, he played a game. I think it was against Everton actually in a mean derby and afterwards his agent had been on to Alex so had said that look, Connor don't want to play right back no more he's a midfielder the same week Jürgen's asking me via he staff for the videos of the most dynamic fullback so there was this little conversation with Connor later in that week but are you sure here because I want to send that video across so no 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 if he well wait a minute you wouldn't play there for me but you'll play there for him so listen he went there and he did really well and he played eight or nine times and and he'll always have that you know a local boy that broke through and played but Connor was a very very good centre midfielder again an England school boy and then he'd moved to full back and and, and and I suppose it's as you get up the levels as well like, and I've talked from my own experience when I was trying to play that you're a good player to a certain level maybe in a certain position and just tweaking and moving position again it can keep you moving forward there's no exact science to it because if there was we wouldn't be doing things like this podcast to debate and talk about the different angles. In the summer of 2015, Connor's Liverpool career was at something of a crossroads. Having spent a very short period of time on loan at Shrewsbury Town the previous season, he was a long way away from the first team. 
and was considering his options and a loan into the lower leagues. I remember I went to Portsmouth um, on trial. Paul Cook was the manager at the time. I only went for a week, played played a friendly, and then he wanted me to come back the week later. But then I think as I was there as well, I was training and all playing, and he mentioned something about midfield as well. Or like say, you know, just something not mentioned or playing midfield. And that's also just give me that more, obviously that's where I wanted wanted to play. But I was there as a, on side as a right back, because that's where you know, I was playing. But yeah, then I ended up going, I think the under 21s were on pre-season in Ireland. Um, and I ended up just going back. Um, obviously they wanted me to go back there for a, to have another look for a week or whatever. But I ended up going to the back of the 21s for pre-season. Um, and then that never... Obviously, not on the last from that. But then, obviously, through halfway through that next season, like you said, then you get your chance to go up and, you know, maybe you, you would never have made your debut for Liverpool. So I think there's not, I don't wouldn't look back at him and say, oh, I wish I'd done that. I wish because I feel like everything that happens, you know, puts you where you are today. So, um, and obviously, to something to make Liverpool debut, something that I can um, keep with me forever. And that's something that I'll always be proud to say I've done. So, how did you? How did you deal with the the additional limelight like, when you when you do make your first team debut and you start making a few appearances for the first team? Did you feel there was a different kind of pressure and was was you a little bit more well known and and how did you deal with that side of it off the pitch? Yeah, I think it's all it's all brilliant. It's all, it's all brilliant. If first make your debut and everyone's you know supporting you and and, and, and rooting for you, especially if, if you're a local lad. Um, and obviously, if you're in town and you're out or you're doing whatever, some people, you know, do start noticing you. It's 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 surreal. Do you know what I mean? You've gone from just being what you used to, and then things like that change. But in terms of football, I think it's everything's just it's always the same. You know, you're just going in every day, you're training, you're working hard, and trying to trying to do what you can. But yeah, I think the mental side probably is is. I wouldn't say I wasn't mentally ready, but I probably wasn't mentally prepared in terms of like. You know, when you start making game appearances and then, like, I remember, like, you're looking on social media to see what people are saying about you and people who, who are irrelevant to you and have no input on your career or whatever, you're reading these messages and they're slating you or the odd person, if they're, you know, they're giving you praise, you feel good off it and if they're slating you, you're letting it get to you and, and, and like, sort of get you down and affect your confidence. But these are people that aren't going to do, you know, they're not going to have any impact on your career. Um, so that's one thing I would have would change in terms of not like you know looking on social media and you no know, because obviously you're new to it and, and you're young and you know maybe you'd rather be you know you're worried not worried but you're just looking to see how, what people think of you and it's new to have people reacting to how you play um, at that, that at that sort of level and and that that big so I think there's definitely different pressures that you know we don't expect or you're not used to and it because it is something new. Um so I think that's one thing that if you have to you know look back and say what would have done different, I probably wouldn't have just I would have just concentrated on on me and not thought more about like you know letting negative comments or things like that sort of get to you and then affect your confidence and then that ends up affecting your your saying and your games and things like that. Do you feel like it really really did affect you? Yeah it probably did if I'm, if I'm being totally honest. Um like to be, yeah, it probably would to be fair, because you know when you're looking on Twitter and that, not when you're young, you like you, you're new to it and you wanting people to you know to think that you're doing well and you want to, you know, you're from Liverpool and you want people in the city to think you're doing you're doing good and that's so why you're probably just creating an unnecessary pressure for yourself that you don't need. Um, like obviously you're saying an hard you're working hard, so there's enough pressure. From that you can give yourself, but then if you're looking at externally at other people and that, it's just it can it can it can build up and I probably would say yeah it was like I can remember there was I think when he played Exeter away in the cup, um you know we ended up drawing the game and then we were all the lads were on the bus on the way back and Alex and Goforth who's the academy you know the academy manager. Was ringing us all, and then he rang me and said, "The fuck you done? You know, you done very well. They defended well. You done your job. It was a tough night and all that." Um, and then you read, then you, then you're on your way home, and you're looking on Twitter, and you're seeing like people slating you, and you're taking that more than what the, 
you know, the academy managers telling you you've done. So you look at, I think it's, it's, it's something like, if you look back, you would never get drawn into it or think too much about it. But obviously when you're young, you don't really, you've never experienced it before. So I think I probably did, like, sort of, not let it get to me, but like, sort of, take, take too much notice of, of, of things like that. Because um, like I said, some, no, half the stuff you're reading is from people that just have got no input on, on, on your life or, or your career. And you know, I think it's sort of that if it, if it went back, and probably that's a good lesson that you can you can take from it if you could go back in time. Like, did you speak to anyone at the time about how you was feeling, or did you feel did you feel like you could mention it to anyone that it was affecting you, or did you just just try and get on with it and and sort of tough it out? No, I think at the um, well, obviously on the first half, you sort of just first couple of games, you're just on a high still, do you know what I mean? And then, you know, you you start if you're getting a bit of stick or something, or you're seeing things written about you or said about you or whatever, then it starts to get to get you down a bit. Um but no, I think I can remember my agent at the time, I was speaking to him and you're confident when your confidence is just shot or whatever, or you're feeling the pressure. And yeah, I did go to see a um, a sports psychologist about it. And things like that, just about like sort of just getting focused and positivity and things like that. But um, yeah, it probably did. When you look back now as well, you probably look at it and think, yeah, it did affect me, like on and off the pitch as well. Like you go home and you know you don't really want to do nothing. You don't want to go out and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be seen. Like I can remember, there's there's a few, there's a few times after a few games and stuff. I can't remember it. I think it was, it was the Wolves game. I hadn't played for a while that season, I don't think, and then I, I, my first, so this would have been the season after, the season after the main debut and that, and then I think it was, yeah, like a cup game and we got beat, and I come off at half time, I, was, I didn't play well, I know, and, um, yeah, I didn't have a good game, whatever, but I remember that, that at half time, like the lads got out and just in the, in, the, in the showers and that, and you're just thinking like, you feel ashamed more than anything, I think, so obviously my girlfriend at the time was at the game, and the cars in the car park and that. And I think my mates were up there and in the lounge or whatever and rang us I'm going straight to the car, just meeting me at the car. And then I just remember just walking out, putting your hood up. And then I just jumped in the back of the car and just sat there because I thought I don't even want to drive out and sit in the front of the car and let people like, you know, see me driving out. Because that probably was the, the emotion that you'd feel. It was a shame. Like I've just played bad, we've been beaten off out the cup. And then you take that home with you then as well. So I think it is when you step up and you do get that opportunity, it's brilliant, but it, it is tough on, on like the, the mental side of things and because it's just a completely new sort of pressure that you've never you've never experienced before. Jürgen, you're responsible for team selection. You explained why you selected the team that you did today, but you couldn't have got off to the worst start. No, no, yeah, yes, it could have been worse if you get it in the first second, so it was on the first minute. Um, but you're right. Um, I explained why I, why I um, took this lineup, and I'm 100% responsible for the performance. So, because I thought we are we are ready. In this lineup for this game, obviously we weren't. I can really relate to exactly what you're saying, and I, I had exact same experience at Luton. And I remember, you know, comparing Luton to Liverpool is is um, miles apart, and like, obviously where the clubs are. But I remember a game exactly the same, and I remember walking straight past my family. I said, "Look, I don't want to speak to anyone. Let me let me get in my car." But what I'm really passionate about now is almost like normalising emotions for for players and for you to be able to speak to someone in a club or just say how you're feeling. If you're feeling nervous about going into a game or if you're feeling ashamed afterwards, if you're feeling low on confidence, is you not it not being seen as a weakness that you can go and speak to someone and feel comfortable speaking to a coach or a physio or a player care person or an agent. It's almost like normalising that emotion because I've seen it hold so many players back do you feel it did hold you back in any way? I'd, I'd say it probably did. Um, in terms of like you know, you got like you said, you're going into a game and and you're already like you're half shitting yourself. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you know, you'd be in a tunnel before the game and obviously the stadium's full or whatever. And you're going out and you you know the nerves are getting to you and that's taking away half the energy before you you even played the game. Um, and then you're probably going into games thinking, oh, what if I do this wrong? What if I make this mistake rather than what if I go and do this or I do that good thing? So I think it's easy to look back and say, oh, I should have done, I shouldn't have let it bother me. I could have went and played, you know, freely and confident and all that. But obviously at the time, it's it's difficult to to say. But 
like you said there, I think it grows with experience. You now things happen in life that are bigger than football, and I know other things happen like now, and it, you'd be a completely different person. Now you could go back in the same position. You'd go, yeah, I did have a bad game, but like, no, it's a game of footy. No, nothing. Like, I can go back. I can work on it. And I think, I think obviously at the time, because it's new and you want to do so well and you're dying to like make an impression on, on everyone and you know, it's what, what you've wanted since you're a kid. You probably just overthink everything and then go into, into things far you know, more than you need to, really. I think it really shows the high intensity of playing for, for Liverpool. Um, we've seen a number of examples involving Jordan Rossiter and, and you as well of fans, keyboard warriors, or whatever you want to call them, um, God forbid that you boys didn't end up becoming Steven Gerrard, Jamie Carragher or Robbie Fowler or whatever else. Um, you are extremely talented boys, but you didn't end up playing 500 times for Liverpool. And the, the mocking that, that we've seen online for, for Jordan, you and other lads are quite, quite extraordinary. And the, the one thing that I wanted to bring to your attention, and forgive me, mate, for saying this, but have you ever put your name into YouTube and seen that, that someone's created a video which basically takes the piss out of you for being the world's best right back? On yeah. the basis of you're obviously not the world's best right back. Well, you're obviously yeah. not the world's best right back, but you're about a million times better than me and the keyboard warriors that, that produce that kind of stuff. Do you ever do you ever do you watch that video? And how do, no, I don't. How like do you that feel thing. about the individual who creates something like takes his time to create something like that? That's the thing. Like when I look back at like me at that, you no, know, nineteen, twenty, or whatever, however old I was, that would have affected me. And I'll, I'll be looking for stuff in like. You know, not looking for bad, but you're looking, but obviously you're going to see bad things with it. And then you'd you, you take that with you and keep it with you. And it's just like, now I just laugh. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not. But I've got a funny story about that because I can remember it was when I went to Bulgaria, actually. The agent, uh, obviously, went up with my agents at the time. And there was a Bulgarian agent who'd done the, done the deal as well over there. Um, and he, he got that up. And, but I think he thought it was like a real highlights video, you know what I mean? So I was like, no, nah, you don't need to, you don't need to watch that. Like we just signed a deal with Sand and all that. He was sitting there having something to eat. And um and then but he got I think, and then but he showed me like this thing and I seen it. I thought, no, nah, I was like, I didn't like I mean his English weren't the best or whatever. But I was like, I was uh, so it's a good job we made the uh, we'd sign a contract before he watched that one. <laughs> yeah, it's just like you said, it's just the way you look at things and it comes with experience, don't it? I think, like you said, there's people like why I look back and I think, why was I reading comments off people that have got no no impact on my career? They're not gonna, I'll never cross paths with them. They, I don't care about, you know, the only opinion you should care about is obviously your coaches, your family, the people you love, and that they're the only opinions that matter. So for me now, it's you look back and think, oh, could they, like, if you had this sort of experience and, and that head on your shoulders, then it wouldn't have bothered you, but. It's easier said than done as you're a young lad. You know, you, you put the pressure on yourself as, you know, you, you're desperate to do well. But like like Fraser said before, I think it's important, like if anyone is even feeling that, just to go and have a conversation, you can make it 10 times better. I just think that we focus so much on the physical side and like the technical side, the tactical side. But the one thing that I found that probably held me back from going a bit higher, you've said it might have held you back. And I've seen it happen to hundreds and hundreds of other lads is the mental side. and just when you are thrust into a first team, can you, can someone, I know a lot of it comes through experience, but can someone, someone show you some techniques or can someone work with you mentally and, you know, just focus a lot more on the mental side, the emotional side than we do, well, focus on that as much as we do the technical, tactical side, because the amount of lads that are affected, I put most of my bad performances down to in my head. 100%, 100%. I think, like you said, I think, when you're confident, you know, also like when you're playing, you're, you're a different player. So like when you're going into games and, and, and your confidence is shot or you're, you know, you're worried about doing things wrong before you even started the game, you've got no chance to perform at like the level that, you know, you could possibly, you know, your best, your best level. So it's not going to happen. But I think, as you were saying, it's just like, it's a conversation that can easily be had, but sometimes it's hard and you don't want to go in and say like, you know, sometimes you can feel like, oh, I'm going to look weak, I'm going to go in and, you know, we're going to, I've, I've played the game or two games, three games and seen some bad stuff and my head's gone or my, head, my, like, my confidence has gone off them. I think, oh, you're weak, you're not mentally ready to, to do this or you can't, obviously you're not ready for this kind of, this kind of challenge or whatever. 
you know, no one looks at it now as being weak or if you go in and say, oh, no, I'm struggling. It's breaking that stigma because if you are nervous going into a game and you you know you want to act tough and not say anything, then you're going to go out nervous. But if you if you're nervous before a game and it's it's fine to be nervous and it's comfortable a coach knowing it and they can help you with it, then you're going to go out and you're going to perform better. So it's just it's just breaking that cycle of normalising emotions. Like being nervous isn't always a bad thing. If it's not seen as a bad thing, then coaches and staff and other people can help players with it so I just think it's a massive area that needs improvement in football and you know something I'm, I'm really passionate about trying to change as well. Can I ask you about that Wolves game because and is it that was your last ever game for Liverpool? Yeah I think I did like like I mentioned before I can, I can remember it clear as day going into the changes getting taken off and just stood in the shower and I was just I think the game was on um, in the changes on the telly and I was like it was. I felt ashamed of even being honest. You know what I mean. I, I felt felt embarrassed. I felt like you know you, you're letting everyone down and you're letting people down and things like that. Um, and that's yeah. Like I said before, it's just all my mates. I think who come to watch me, a few of my mates, my family do it upstairs, and obviously you go and speak to them and whatever. And I just remember just going straight to the car. Um, I think I was yeah. I was sat in the back of the car, put me up like hiding. Do you know what I mean? But like. Not that that makes any difference, but that's just that at the time, that's the way I felt. I just wanted to go home, get in the house, and and stay in the house. Um, and that, yeah, I can remember, I can remember it clear that that night. I think my, my sister and my little nephew and I come round, and obviously when they they left, just go go to bed and, and, and try and go to sleep. And it was better to I couldn't remember that night leaving. Think I can't wait, just go to bed tonight, go to sleep, and just like sort of shut off from everything. But yeah, even being honest, I, I found it. I did find it tough, and I probably not just football. I probably took it with me outside of football as well. Just think, like that's just the biggest emotion that I can is you know being half ashamed. Just even like going out and like you just wouldn't want to go places and people to see and God, there's that 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 that, that shit player there or whatever things like that. But yeah, it didn't. It then once once went to heart and I started playing there, and obviously that's when you get your confidence back, and then. You know, you're playing in front of the fans and they, they see what you can do and it, it sort of changes. But I definitely I definitely kept it with me for a lot longer than I probably should have and I did dwell on it and probably let it get to me in a way that I would never do now. Well, that's you, you mentioned Hearts and as you say, that was the that was like your recovery and um, you played a, a full season up in Edinburgh. You played in Edinburgh Derbys, you played at Ibrox, you played at Celtic Park. yeah. Yeah, I think when you talk about big games, obviously when you make your debut, that's the one of the best moments of your life. It's a dream come true. That was more like the next. I was a heart. It was the first time you felt like it, that was the you sort of you start your career. You know, you're playing. You know, week in week out, most weeks playing. You know, at a good level and putting your body under different demands that it's never been under. And obviously, the more you play, the more confidence you get, and you start to. I started to enjoy football again. Yeah, and probably the big and then we, we beat we beat Celtic four 0 at home, and that was probably you know it's, it's tough to say anything's better than than your debut. That was probably the best, still probably my best moments in football now. Um, and beat them four 0 after the game, and then the atmosphere and, and the fans, and you know you you feel part of something, and that's sort of when you think like you know this is what football is about. This is why you you know you've done it all your life, and and you go up for for moments and. You no know, games and, and times like that. So, you no, know, I really enjoyed my time there. It was something that obviously at the time I needed to sort of kickstart my career, and get myself going, and like you said, sort of build that confidence, confidence back up, and and get myself enjoying football again. So, yeah, it was a good season, and it was something that you know I look, still look back on now with you know fond memories. You went when you went back to Liverpool. You had one last season to run your contract down, and I, and I guess that was where you were trying to find well, what is my next permanent move. Uh, you went to Rochdale. I think you only played a handful of games before you fractured your cheekbone. So, I mean, that, did that? I mean, did that really mess up your plans? Yeah, I think obviously the season before I'd been a heart, and you no, know, it was my first really like you know full season playing playing footy and come back, and obviously it was sort of you know at the time you got well, back 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 training, went on loan to Heart, and then come back and you have the off season and then I got a message to say you're brought into the academy at this date. So obviously you know then, you know, you know it's not 
you know, going back. Um, I don't I wasn't really expecting to at the time anyway. So I went back to the academy. Um done my pre season there. Which was which is hard, like I'm being honest, you not know, going back, you've been there you know, so many years and you played the the twenty ones that years and then you're coming back in and you're saying them with lads who you know, you've seen as little little kids who are like three, four years younger than you know, whatever. So that was that was tough in itself. But I remember that that season, yeah, I just remember keeping fit over the off season, come back, come back fit and I was this I was look obviously I went to I think I had the chance to go to another team in Scotland on loan. That I ended up I ended up turning it down. But I think it was because obviously I was a heart last year, the year before, and I'd done all right and I was wanting to, you know, stay at you know, that kind of level or push on. And this team I think they were they were lower down in the league. So because it was early on as well, it was a tough one. I didn't know what I wasn't sure what to do, but I ended up um, turning that one down. And then Rochdale came up late on. So I went there. We played one game in the cup and then it was the second game. It was only my second game for them, like ten minutes in or whatever, when I fractured me my cheekbone and I um, so I, t- I went back to the academy, done all my rehab there and everything. And then I was only there till January on loan, so I can't what my was went back. There wasn't too long, too long left. And obviously then the come back to Liverpool in the in the January and just sort of see see me contact out there. And at that stage, you're going back, your contract's running down. You're 22 or maybe 23 by that point. 23, yeah. Was it saying 23, yeah. Are you feeling a little bit lost at this stage? Yeah. Yeah, it was difficult, even being honest. It was sort of, you're there, but you're not fully, like, your head's, your head's not on it, so you're not... Not that you're doing nothing terrible, but you're not probably not applying yourself in training, like, the way you should be or things, because it's hard, because you think... I remember the window passed, and then it was like, right, so I'm, I'm in the, back in the 21 now for the rest of the season. And like I said, you know, you played... You started playing there with three, four, five years before or whatever. So you're going back and it, it was difficult. It was hard to, to go back and sort of get your head on it and get and get your head straight. So it was sort of like, I don't know, I don't know how you describe it, but it was just just plodding along, just getting through it, just just waiting for the, for the season to end. Um, hard to, it's hard to motivate motivate yourself when you're going back in after you've had a taste of first team football. Yeah. Would you um what what are your thoughts on the under twenty three system and have you seen a lot of players that almost get stuck in there for, for too long rather than going out and playing games? Yeah, I think it's it's obviously it's, it's good and, and when you're young, because I remember when we first started playing under 20, under 20, 21, we had a young team who were like just come up and so it's, it's like because it's the next next step. It's good. It's a challenge for you. But then obviously, like you said, you get stuck in it. It starts just like, you know, you're going into games and there's nothing, especially if you've been in first team where there's points on the line and, you know, you're playing for a position, you're playing for your team, you're placing the team the next week and, and things like that. And you, you're playing for your career then, do you know what I mean? So, it's it, like you said, it's good, but I don't think it's good for a long time. Unless you're one of them that goes to the first team and, and you know, you're like a different talent, then, you know, it's probably it's probably better to get, get out as soon as you can and, and, and try and get on loan and, and gain that experience and sort of get your, your, your career starting as, as soon as possible. In the summer of 2019, having spent 18 years in some form or other associated with Liverpool, Connor was released at the end of his contract. Negotiations to sign a permanent deal with Blackpool fell through when the manager was sacked and he found himself without a club. His next move would be a surprising one, to the top division in Bulgaria with Arda Kazali. So you go out to Bulgaria. What was it, what was it like day to day at uh, Arda Kazali? Yeah, it was. It was a it was a step out out of your comfort zone. It was it was completely different. I think if you're going from like obviously being at home where I was living today, you couldn't have got two different ends of the spectrum in terms of the place. The footy was you know, just the, the the facilities you had everything everything we needed and that. And I think once you get on the pitch, it's it's football. So like when you're training, that it's sort of that's probably the only time where it's just you feel half normal over there because you just you know you're into into training, but no, it was difficult. Obviously, a lot of the lads who don't don't speak the language and sort of you're not used to, you can't communicate with them um, the way you used to, and you can't sort of create relationships with with a lot of people the way you used to. So it was definitely different from that point. The games were different. I'd say the tempo, the tempo was different. It was a bit slower. You know, a lot of teams sitting off, and there was no, there was there was like a good, there was a few good teams at the top who you know were very good, and then 
as you go lower, the, the standards the standards different. Is there a sort of tendency of all the foreign lads, don't we, we from England, France, or wherever else, to sort of all gravitate towards each other? All the Bulgarian lads are on one side, and all the foreign lads on the other. Yeah, I think they, they just come up that season, and and they had they had they had these good money to be fair in the club. They had the um, you know the owner, the president of the club, and that they were putting putting good money into the club, and that's obviously why they brought a few, a few foreign lads in, which is which is probably good. Like you said, it's like I've never I've never been a foreigner in the changing room before. Then it used to be in you know in the majority, but yeah, it was that that was the case. Even like I said, I've never been on that side before, but there was like there was me, there was another English lad out there, there was a Brazilian lad, Dutch lad. French lad and a lad from Belgium. We all we all spoke English, so we were always together. I would still speak to the, speak to them. Now we've got a few, you know, group group chats and that. But yeah, it just naturally sort of obviously the language is a big is a big is a big thing that brings you together. So you do sort of obviously when you've sat in in changing rooms in England, you see you know the foreign lads do come together and you're not used to to being on that side of it, but you get to see it from from a different point of view out there and. No, it was good. They're all good lads, and even the Bulgarian lads, you know, got on with them well. But yeah, there was a lot of them didn't didn't speak great English. So, in terms of in terms of that and communicating, sort of creating relationships within the within within the changing room, it was probably you know probably one of the difficult things. You spoke before about about dealing with the limelight and you know wanting to almost go unseen when you was in Liverpool. Did this move feel like a little bit of an escape for you? Yeah, that was like that was couldn't have put it better. That's exactly what what it was really. I remember, so I left Liverpool. It was like early May. I didn't go out there till September, like the I think like the fifteenth September. So three four months off, which is I've never had that long since I was you know six since I started. So and even being honest, I enjoyed it. I felt like I needed it. It was like I think just the way things ended and like that motivation had gone and and things like that. I was sort of you know, you'd say like sort of fell out of love with the game. If I'm being honest, like I was then three, four months off. I was still, I was training, like, you know, good, you know, twice a day, some days, and I was in the gym and doing some football sessions with, with a coach in Liverpool and things like that. But I was just enjoying being off. It was, it was just like a, a break, sort of a bit of a relief and you know, just the pressure of football and things like that. I was just, I was happy being off. And if someone said to me, if I'm being honest, like at that time. You can do this, and you can still, you know, get what you need from it or whatever. I probably would have done it if there was something, you know, like if there was, yeah. I'm being honest, probably just fell out, fell out of love with the game at that point. And I remember I was, you know, I was playing golf with my dad in the summer. I can't remember what month it was, and obviously I hadn't, had a, hadn't, hadn't gone to a new club. And you get like, you know, if it goes past a certain month, you get an extra month to pay from your previous club. But I didn't know I was getting it, so we were playing golf, and my agents at the time rang my dad and. You know, told him, and my dad told me, and I just remember feeling like a relief that I didn't have to like go back and I had another month where I, I could like not, you know, just stay. Not that like I was just doing nothing and being happy doing nothing. It was just nice to. I just felt like it was break break that I needed, and it was just then the Bulgarian one come up late, and it was sort of like I've got a. It was September. I've got a. You know, if I wanted to stop playing football, then I don't go. But like I need to, I need to go back and try and. Get myself going again, and then even from the start of that, like the Blackpool won't come up, which would have been a good move. And you know, if you go back, I would, I would have took it now. The way I'm thinking, you know, it would have been a, a good move for me. But thank you, said that I wanted that that sort of escape because my dad was working hard for me, like trying to you know sort moves out and speak with agents and things or someone. I'm saying to him, let's, let's just go abroad or something like. There must be a mad move. I can go somewhere and just sort of go and play somewhere else, you know what I mean? And like you said, it wasn't escape. It was just to get myself like out of England and just go and just go and play where no one knows what you're doing. No one no one really knows you. You can just go and just no pressure. And it's that sort of like a fresh start. So yeah, it was. That's probably the main reason why I was probably waiting out for something like that to happen. Just something that was a bit of a random move and just sort of just to get out the way for a bit. And that break, that break that you have them them three months. Because you signed at an academy so young and you're a fan of that academy as well, so or that club, it's probably the first three months of your, well, in about 15 years that you've actually had the pressure off a little bit because every training session for Liverpool, every game for Liverpool, whether it's a, an under-9s game, an under-23s game, a first-team game, you're always going out and putting yourself you know, in that pressurised situation. 
and it's the first time in about 15 years that you've stepped away from it so it does sound like at that point it probably was a good thing for you because it seemed like it probably got a little bit too much for you and you know mentally you, you probably weren't in a great place at that at that period yeah it probably was even without like saying or whatever like like when that like the the black girl won't come up I, I went to see the manager but I just I, like you said like now you, you take it it was a great you know it would have been a good move for me but at the time I just didn't I mean dad you know dad knows me better than anyone and then but he drove to have me got back in the car and we were talking and he was like you don't want to you don't want to go do you and I was like no and he was like what about you do and like we just talking through things and I was like no I just want to just get me somewhere out the way, batting it off a little bit and all now, because like you said, I was enjoying, I was enjoying, even being totally honest, I was enjoying like, probably the first time I didn't feel like footballer, because I'd, I'd, obviously like you said you've been, since you were six, growing up used to it, and the last season didn't go as planned, and obviously it didn't go how you'd expect it to, to have gone, and, and things like that, and it was just sort of, it was nice, it was just a bit of a release, just to be away from it, and, and you know, to switch off. And just sort of just mentally not be like thinking about football or worrying about football or worrying about different things. It was just like, yeah, it was nice. It was nice. It was like you said, I think it was something that, that I needed at the time. And I was I was waiting out for something that was that was a bit like that, just to sort of get out the way and sort of you know, get a, a clean slate and a fresh start and, and to go again. In terms of the games out there, Con, what's, um, talk to us about the stadiums, the atmospheres. What's, uh, what's Bulgarian football like when you get on the pitch? It was quiet most of the games. It's like, like they are now, they're behind closed doors. And I forgot what it was like. It was like anyway. So I'm half, I think that's why I'm used to, used to it now. But no, it was at the time when I was there, our stadium was getting uh, work done or whatever. So we weren't playing games there. So the, our home games were like in a place an hour and a half away. So there weren't, weren't loads of fans, but I've seen it now. They've gone back to the stadium. It looks good that you know the the fans get there behind the team and support the team. And like the lads were saying when we were there, if we had our stadium, they weren't a big stadium, but it would be quite busy and probably one of the well supported supported teams out there. So I was disappointed I didn't get to experience that. Yeah, because it was quiet. It had like a bit of a friendly sort of feeling to it. So it was hard to sort of not not motivate yourself for the games again, but it was more like. You know, the tempo weren't too high and it was sort of didn't feel like obviously what you're used to when, when you play, you know, in, in, in England and Scotland and whatever. That kind of tempo it wasn't it wasn't like that. So it was it took some like yeah, it was at that sort of friendly, some of the games had sort of friendly, you know, vibes to them. But no, it was like I said, there was some good teams, some good good players out there and, and then there was some some teams that, that weren't weren't so good. But yeah, that was probably one of the one of the one of the biggest difference, like just the tempo and and the atmospheres at, at, at the games. You get to about, I think it would have been about February in Bulgaria when lockdown started to happen. You're, you're, you're there and all of a sudden there's a pandemic and you're being told that you've got to stay in your flat in Bulgaria. I mean, what kind of an experience was that? We were training and we had, we had an away game and then you hear know, whispers like, oh, the games are getting called off or whatever and we got back to the ground and we were getting ready to travel and he said that the games were being called off go on and we were back in on Monday or whatever and obviously that never ended up happening we ended up staying off for however long it was but no I think at the time obviously just taking you don't really know what's going on so you're just waiting to hear what's happening next but obviously over there you're not watching the news and understanding what's going on so you're sort of out the loop you know what I mean you don't know what's I don't know what's happening, you just go go home, go to footy, go back, and that, that was it, really. It was all right at the start, because I had a lad who lived in the same block as me, and then the other the foreign lads were there as well. And then they started going home, and obviously the longer it went on, with flights and stuff, you couldn't get back, and you didn't know what was happening when you come back. So you ended up just being there, it's just you, and you know you go for a run, and then you come back and sit in the apartments all day. And it was all right, because I think at the time, you're just taking it day by day, but... I look back now and think about it, I think I don't know how, how I've done that. Like, I don't know how I, how I lasted that long after we, we'd stopped sailing, do you know what I mean? So, And what happened to your contract at that point? Was it only a one-year contract or did your contract get ripped off because of the pandemic? No, so it was a two-year. You played X amount of games and obviously the season had finished early. I think I needed, at that point, like two more, three more games that activated the clause for the second year. But obviously, once, once that all happened... No, saying like percentage while like we can only pay this much while this is going on and and obviously the foreign lads out there on no a lot more money than the the Bulgarian 
the Bulgarian lads. So, you know, we said obviously the, the difficult times for the club as well. Everyone understands it. So, with the ways and things, it was, you know, it was obviously a difficult time for everyone. But, you know, we ended up just coming to like an agreement for of us, like the, the you know, five of the foreign lads. We were all the same thing, just coming to an agreement with them. We sorted, sorted it out. Yeah, and then just that was it. Then we were free to free to do do whatever we wanted, you know, to leave and that. So we, yeah, we just agreed all that. It wasn't no hassle or whatever. And then he just said, no, you can stay out here until you can get your, your flights back and things like that. So we left the team, then we left the club, and then I was still out there then for like, I think I come back, I come back in May. It was a life experience, like, but it was, uh, yeah, it was definitely definitely different. What what were the club like when that was going on? Were you in communication with them? Were they providing you with guidance about? What was going on? Obviously, you're getting different messages from different people and some people can't speak English. So we were told we could only get paid so much percent while this was going on. And that was that was fine. You know, we, we were all like, yeah, that's fair enough. We understand it. But obviously, the translation was wrong and it was the other way around. So it was, well, we thought we was going to be getting what we wouldn't have been getting. <laughs> so it wasn't much, you know what I mean? So, but obviously, over there, things were different. So they, with a lot of our game, let's know what the club say. This it happened, but obviously we've all got agents and we've got a contract that doesn't state certain things and and whatever. So um, obviously all our agents had a conversation. Like I said, we just come to come to an agreement. You know, we said obviously you know it's difficult for the club, and he was saying you know, we don't didn't know what was going to be happening with the season and when things were going to be back back running and that. So just thought it'd be better just to you know come to an agreement with them and then you'd be free then. So then once things back home started that when you could get yourself sorted rather than be tied in you didn't know whether the league was going to start a different time or start earlier and things like that so it was just better just to you know just to cut just to cut it there and then you could just concentrate on when things getting back and going back and getting yourself sorted but that's the thing about coming back you get back to the uk and you're effectively an unemployed unemployed footballer in the middle of a pandemic how easy or difficult was it to get yourself hooked up with a you know a club in the Scottish Premiership? Yeah, it was. Um, obviously, it was worrying times for everyone, especially in football, especially the lads who haven't got, who didn't have a deal because you know, no one, no one, everyone was unsure. No one really knew what was what was going on. But yeah, I was only home for I think I was home for obviously four weeks. It was that I that I come home. Um, obviously, I haven't missed shots anyway, so nothing was happening. But it was quite easy considering you know the year before I just left Liverpool and. Didn't go anywhere for you know, three, four months. And then I come back in the middle of the pandemic and I was sorted within three, four weeks. So, But then that was probably my mindset as well at the time where I was holding things off more back then. But, but coming back, I had that hunger back and that desire to you know, to, to get myself going again. So my agent just just, just uh, rang me and mentioned a couple of clubs. And, um, well, I, wasn't, I didn't have an agent at the time. Um, I wasn't signed with anyone. So the agent's doing a bit now. He rang me and was doing a bit of work for me, and yeah, just mentioned a couple of clubs, and then rang me back within a few hours and said, you know, do you want to uh, Ross County want you? And, and then the next day I was on like a Zoom call meeting with the manager and the staff, and it was just easy, really. It was it was done done nice and quick, and I just I was just looking forward just to getting back back into back into football again as quick as possible, and you know, feeling you know part of part of the team, and think of being out there as well, coming back to. Know, a bit more comfortable and, and what you used to, um, and obviously like a league I've played in before. Yeah, it was no brainer for me, and it was it was nice and uh, nice and easy. To, we got done nice and quick. And um, have you been having any conversations with your gaffer up at Ross County about whether or not you might go back to midfield? No, <laughs> <laughs> I come to terms with that. No, that was a couple of years ago. <laughs> Brilliant. And do you feel do you feel mentally you're in the best position of your career? Do you feel do you feel happy where you are at the minute? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I think just like I said, you go back up experiences and different things, but then you just obviously as, as things happen in life and different things happen, it puts some certain stuff into perspective. And you know, you might have had a bad game, and it does. It's still even now if you have a bad game, it does sit with you, and, and it, you know it dwells on you, and you go home and and you you know you know you're not feeling good, and your weekend can be ruined. But it's sort of You've got that feeling where you're, you know, you think about it, but at the same time, you just got to brush it off, and then you think, to it, I'm going to go to training next week, and then try and, you know, fix it and, and put it right. And but I think, like I said, it's hard. Like the best way you can learn that is from experience. So difficult when you haven't got it to 
to know how to deal with certain certain things. But yeah, for me now it's just yeah, mentally I think going off obviously different things that you you can take on board that happen. It just put it puts you in puts you in good stead. So yeah, you just don't let things get to you as much, I don't think, as you get a bit older. Or you don't you don't over overthink things that you you know you make massive in your own head that aren't actually that big. And you see, you know, other things happening in different, you know, not even to do with football, different things happen in life. And, you know, you see people around you, you know, going through difficult times and you look out there, we act and out there, you know, getting on with the life and you can take inspiration from that. Um, and I, I've done that quite a lot. That's probably one of the big things as well. That sort of changes your mindset when you see people, you know, dealing with things and that are a lot worse than having a bad game. And, and they, you know, they they're dealing with it in different ways and you can sort of you know just put stuff into perspective and you just think like there's always someone who's in a lot worse position than you so I think you've just got to concentrate on you know on the good things and not put too much pressure on yourself because it's only gonna it'll just it'll only affect you in a bad way in the end as well and finally Con, you're obviously in a really really good place at the moment um you're playing at a really high standard in the Scottish Premiership so you're happy where you are so I'm not going to ask you about wanting to leave Ross County but <coughs> Do you have half an eye on the future on the English Premier League? Do you think you've got the ability to come back and play at that level? Obviously, that's always the dream for anyone to go, you know, to play at the highest level that, that you possibly can. But one thing that I, I never look at, like, too far into not and now, it'll just be take, you know, take, take things as they come and concentrate week by week and, and game game by game and and then what what will happen will happen. Um, but I think... I mean, now it's just like just concentrate on yourself, do the best, you know, get yourself, you know, the best prepared for 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 your for your job, and and just sort of just just concentrate on things as they are, and not not worry too much about you know not worry about anything in the future or not and that's happened in the past. It's just I think you can only think about things that you can control, so there's no point like you know thinking about stuff that's happened or that might happen that like you can't physically do anything about. Like I'm just. Yeah, so it's more just take everything in your stride there. That's probably the way I look at things now. And I feel like that's something that's helped me, you know, just have a, have a clear head over things and make you think a lot more positively about stuff. These these experiences in football, like you sound like a wise old man talking at the minute, but football makes you grow up quick. And the experiences that you've packed in in 25 years old, to have packed in what you've packed in and to be as wise as you are at the minute, and you've still got plenty of time left in the game and then, you know, what you can contribute after that. It, it does sound that you've learned a hell of a lot on the way. Loads of ups and downs, but unbelievable experience for a 25-year-old. I think that's, that's part of it. Obviously, you get to experience different things, you know, by going, you know, out to your comfort zone and experience, you know. I think, like, when I was, like, when I went out there last year, it was, it wasn't just football. I was sort of, like, just the life experience, look at it in that way. Um because I think as you get older, you look at football differently as well sometimes. And obviously when things happen, you just you can get drawn in on things and hold on to different stuff. But then as like, you know, different things happen in your life and you experience different stuff, you sort of just have more of a broad like look out on things. And yeah, it's definitely even that's one thing I can say, like even like going out there, it was a life experience. The football didn't work out with everything going on the way it was, but you can still take stuff from it. And whether that's you know, different stuff from life that can make you you know, it can still help you with your football, with different things and the way you look at stuff and that. So, no, I think it's all, like I said, it's easier to look when you've had like, different experiences, easier to learn from them. But I think, of it and, you know, you know, you learn lessons with, with experience and I think it's just important that you take, you know, the good stuff and even from bad situations, take, take the good bits out of it and just, just keep that with you. Thank you so much for sharing your, uh, your story with us, mate. It's been fantastic. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Football Journeys um, and thank you to all those who supported us. Do come and find us on social media at Journeys Pod on both Twitter and Instagram where we'll be sharing more content. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us on footballjourneys at b5consultancy.com or visit our webpage b5consultancy.com slash footballjourneys. This podcast is produced by B5 Consultancy alongside Ricky Valentine, who himself had an academy journey with me at Brentford FC. Special thanks goes to the Hope Street Hotel for their hospitality and Liverpool FC for supplying some of their archive footage. Lastly, thanks to the lads for telling their stories and to the contributors who gave up their time to share their memories of the lads. Please do like and subscribe. If you feel we deserve a five-star rating, then please give us one. 
The more successful this podcast is, the better chance we have of producing more, more episodes and further series.